live from the Museum of the Rockies here in Bozeman, Montana today. We're so excited to be wrapping up the 2019 year with you. I'm Jamie Ox, the Outreach Program Manager. I'll be your MC today, so you'll hear me at times, but won't be able to see me. I want to introduce you to jo Dr. John Scanella. John is the John R. Horner Curator of Paleontology. Dr. Scanella studies dinosaur evolution and growth and is passionate about sharing the excitement and importance of paleontology with you today. In just a few minutes, Dr. Scanella will help us explore life patterns of dinosaurs to help us better understand how they grew up. And just on your screen, you should see and hear me. If you cannot, please let us know. Our friends and partners at Streamable Learning are also on hand today to assist with any IT needs. Feel free to use the chat box at any time throughout the program if you have any questions. We'll do our best to answer those. If we don't get to them immediately, we'll definitely try to answer them at the end. Before Dr. Scanella begins, we're going to give you a brief, brief tour of where we're at today here in Bozeman. Angie's going to pull that up for us. There we are, Bozeman, Montana. We are about 80 miles north of the beautiful Yellowstone Park and 315 miles-ish from Canada. We are located in the beautiful and historic Gallatin Valley at the Museum of the Rockies on the campus of Montana State University. That's the entrance to the museum. If you've been here, you might recognize it. To start our dinosaur education for today, can any of you tell me what kind of dinosaur greets you as you walk in the museum? You can practice typing into that chat box. See, we'll see how good you are at your dinosaur trivia. Any guesses? T-Rex. We've got a T-Rex. Good job. All right, we're gonna enter through the museum. Oh, one more shot of Big Mike, looking snowy just like he is today. We're going to enter the Siebel Dinosaur Complex, where we'll see an Allosaurus as we go to the Hall of Horns and Teeth, a T-Rex, and a Triceratops. But I'm not going to tell you any more about dinosaurs, because Dr. Scanella is the expert here. And let us begin. Hi, everybody. Uh, again, I'm John Scanella, the Curator of Paleontology here at the Museum of the Rockies, and currently we are downstairs below the exhibits that uh, Jamie just showed you in one of the collections areas at the museum. So behind me, you can see there's all kinds of cases and cabinets and shelves, and uh, they are all filled with the remains of dinosaurs and uh, other ancient creatures. So I am a paleontologist, which is a scientist that studies ancient life. So I spend a lot of time investigating uh, what was life like on the planet a long time ago, how has it changed over time, and trying to understand what the world was like uh, back in the past. And one of the things that paleontologists might use to explore what life was like in the past are fossils. And fossils are the preserved remains of living things. And there's different types of fossils, but I can give you an example right here. This is a lower jaw bone, a dentary, this bone of a duck-billed dinosaur named Brachylophosaurus that lived in Montana in the Cretaceous period. You can see on this side, there's some teeth right there still in the jaw. And this is just an example of one of the fossils uh, taken from one of these cabinets here downstairs at the Museum of the Rockies. So we can learn a lot about what this animal was like by studying this fossil. But before we can study the fossils back here in the labs at the Museum of the Rockies, um, paleontologists often spend a lot of time going out trying to find the fossils that we can study uh, and learn more about these animals. And so in order to do that, particularly if we're studying dinosaurs, and most uh, dinosaurs other than their living descendants, the birds lived uh, quite a long time ago, we have to kind of travel back in time to be able to find the fossils of dinosaurs. So here is a chart of geologic time on the planet Earth. 
uh, kind of like a calendar, but instead of showing days of the month or months of the year, it shows the history of time on this planet. And so uh, up here at the top is where we are today. And all the way down at the bottom is uh, the beginning of the Earth. And so dinosaurs lived during an era known as the Mesozoic era, which is on here in this green zone between about 251 and 66 million years ago. So if we want to explore what dinosaurs were like, we first must go back to the time of dinosaurs. So if you're at the surface of the Earth today, and if you dig down through time and go down to about here-ish, we haven't gone back far enough to uh, study dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex or Triceratops or Brachybrochosaurus. If we go down here, we've gone too far. And there's lots of cool fossils from uh, these time zones, but we wouldn't find dinosaurs down there uh, if we've gone too far back. We need to kind of target this area of time. And so often what paleontologists do is we spend a lot of time working with geologists who are scientists that study the earth, its processes and how it works. And some geologists spend quite a lot of time putting together maps of the surface of the earth that can help us figure out where we might go uh, to find rocks and thus fossils of a certain age. And so an example of one of these maps is right here. I think you can see that. So this is a geologic map of the state of Montana, uh, made by the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology in Butte. And what you're seeing here, uh, all these colors represent different geologic formations. Uh, so basically each color uh, is a different age of rock at the surface of the earth. And one of the things you might notice just in taking a quick glance at this map of Montana is that there's a lot of green uh, and green on this map means rocks from the Cretaceous period. Cretaceous is the last period of the Mesozoic era. It's where animals like Triceratops and T-Rex and other dinosaurs like that lived. So just by taking a quick look at this map, we can tell that Montana is a good place to go to find the fossils of dinosaurs because there's a lot of the right age rock uh, exposed at the surface uh, in Montana. There's a lot of green coloration there. And if we pull up the first slide, Jimmy, if we go out in the field, as we do uh, every summer looking for fossils, uh, and we go out into some of eastern Montana, this is what it looks like in some areas. This is actually uh, in Garfield County, Montana, in what's known as the Hell Creek Formation, which is the geologic unit that represents the very end of the age of dinosaurs. It's where you might go to find T-Rex or Triceratops. Uh, and you can see that uh, there's nice exposure of hills and valleys with the rocks right at the surface of the earth. Uh, so there are places, many places on earth, where the right age rock might be exposed at the surface. But once you go there, the rocks might be covered up. For example, I used to live in New Jersey, and you can find dinosaur fossils in New Jersey. The right age rock is there in places, but in many places, it might be covered up by parking lots or malls. And so Montana has this great combination of not only having the right age rock at the surface of the earth, uh, but also having it exposed so we can go out and explore these areas. So pretty much every summer, uh, the paleo team here heads out uh, into areas like this in Montana to look for fossils. Uh, first, we must get the appropriate permissions before doing so. Often we uh, apply for permits, depending on which land we're going on. But once we have the proper permission, we can go out and start exploring and looking for fossils. And if we pull up the next slide, uh, you're going to see uh, some images of field work from the last few years. Uh, field crews out uh, excavating triceratops in some cases in these pictures in eastern Montana. And you might also notice uh, there's these big white blobby things. Uh, those are called field jackets and that's basically inside of those are the fossils of dinosaurs. And so I have one here to show you up close. This is 
a field jacket that was made in the field and brought back here to the museum. So inside here are the bones of a dinosaur. And a field jacket like this one is made up of layers of burlap and plaster. And we encase the bones in this in order to protect them, to bring them in from the field uh, to the lab in a way similar to if someone was to break a bone, perhaps, uh, the doctor might create a cast to protect the bones. This is basically purely to protect the bones for transport from the field uh, back to the lab. And once the bones are safely brought back here, if we pull up the next slide, they go to one of our fossil preparation labs where fossil preparators uh, work on the fossils. And the preparators are, are people who work to carefully remove the rock that has encased the bones for millions of years. So in these images, you can see one of these field jackets being opened and then uh, the preparators carefully removing the rock from around the bone. And in this case, these are, these are bones of a, a triceratops. So the bottom left hand there, as you can see, it's part of the jaw of a triceratops that has had some of the rock removed. And on the lower right, you can see two horns uh, from a triceratops that we collected a few years ago uh, being prepped back here in the lab. So once the fossils are prepared uh, back in the laboratory, then we can begin studying these animals here uh, in the collections or in the laboratory. Uh, and when I'm talking about dinosaurs, you might have certain images of dinosaurs uh, coming to your mind, such as uh, you might think of Tyrannosaurus rex or Triceratops or big long neck dinosaurs like Brachiosaurus. And in some cases, dinosaurs could be very, very big, like the animals I just named. Uh, but some dinosaurs weren't very big. But in all cases, it's kind of neat to remember that dinosaurs, like all animals, uh, changed as they grew up from babies to adults. They didn't start out as huge uh, creatures. They had a whole lifespan uh, from being teeny tiny to getting bigger uh, until they got as big as they eventually would. Uh, and so we don't just go out and study huge bones of dinosaurs, we collect and examine a whole range of different sizes of fossils to try to learn as much as possible about how dinosaurs grew up so we can learn more about what they were like as living creatures. And so there's a whole range of fossils that we might study to do this. For example, can anyone tell me what kind of fossil this is? What, what is this a fossil of? You have some guesses? Go ahead and type it into the chat box. I'll blurt them out to John. Any guesses on what kind of fossil I am holding? Nothing? Nothing. Okay. This is a fossilized dinosaur egg. And so you can see it's circular. It's kind of egg shaped. In this case, it's kind of flattened because it's been squished uh, by spending so much time in the earth. It might be a little difficult to see, but this particular egg has little bumps on the uh, surface. I'll show you another type of dinosaur egg here. Different type of egg. Here's the eggshell here. And in this case, uh, the eggshell is smooth instead of bumpy. And so Paleontologists that study dinosaur eggs, one of the things that they look at is the surface texture of the eggs. And some of the first ever dinosaur eggs discovered in North America were found right here in Montana about uh, 40 years ago. Marion Brambold, who lived up in the northwestern part of the state, discovered some teeny tiny little bones. And when she had the opportunity, she showed them to uh, Jack Horner and Bob Mackle, who at the time were with Princeton University, but later would go on to work with the Museum of the Rockies. Jack Horner was the former curator of paleontology here. And they identified these tiny bones that had been found as the bones of little baby dinosaurs, which was very exciting at the time because up until then, no one had seen 
the bones of teeny tiny baby dinosaurs. So they asked Marion Branvold if she could take them to the spot where she had found them, and she did. And when they got there, they found more tiny uh, dinosaur bones surrounded by bits of broken dinosaur eggshell. And these were all in uh, concavities, depressions uh, in the surface of the earth that kind of looked like uh, a nest. Uh, and eventually outside the nest, uh, nearby, not that far, was discovered the bones of a large dinosaur that kind of looked like the bones of the little dinosaurs inside the nest. And then nearby, they found evidence of more nests. And so this was uh, a really exciting discovery uh, because it was the first ever evidence that some dinosaurs, at least, might have cared for their young, that the little dinosaurs would hatch out of, out of their eggs and then uh, spend some time in the nest. And the fact that there were multiple nests altogether suggested that dinosaurs might have been nesting in groups, kind of like the way that some birds uh, do today. You see like uh, colonies of penguins or pelicans or things like that. And so the dinosaur that was discovered in those nests and around them looked something like this. This is a model of one of the, the little dinosaurs, the bones of which were found inside the nest the larger bones nearby looked similar to this, but a bit larger. And at the time, this was a brand new species of dinosaur that had been discovered in Montana. And so they named it Myasaur, <clears throat> Myasaura, which means the good mother reptile, uh, because there was evidence that it had uh, parental care uh, and cared for its young. So. Uh, this was discovered, and then nearby, the different types of eggs of other dinosaurs were discovered, including eggs that look like this, which I showed you a little while ago. Now, just looking at it, uh, it's an egg, it's got a shell, uh, but how might we be able to determine what kind of dinosaur laid this egg? Uh, can anyone as we guessed it, how we might be able to explore uh, what kind of dinosaur laid an egg like this. All educated guesses welcome. Yes. <laughs> Any guesses? No guesses, John. No guesses. So, to look at it. Oh, break it oh, open. Oh. That's the guess. Good guess. <laughs> so there's a number of ways that we could kind of get an idea of what dinosaur might have laid an egg. Uh, but in some cases, we can take a peek inside a dinosaur egg like that one. So here's a section of one of these eggs uh, right here. That's a bit of the, let's see, there. Uh, that's a bit of the eggshell, the smooth eggshell on the outside. And if I flip it over here, inside the egg are the bones of this tiny embryo dinosaur uh, before it hatched uh, out of the egg, still preserved in the egg there. So this bone up here, this big bone, is called the ilium. It's part of the hip. And then this longish bone down here is the femur. The thigh bone, you can see it's going right into the socket. So that's that's uh, this bone <laughs> going into the hip socket uh, for this little dinosaur. And so by looking at the bones inside of the egg, it's possible to study them and their shapes and compare them to other dinosaur bones that have been found and figure out what kind of dinosaur laid those eggs. And in this case, those eggs were laid by a dinosaur named Truodon. Uh, this is a uh, cast of what the skull of a Truodon would look something like. Uh, you can see that uh, there's the, the eyes here looking at you. Uh, so Truodon and its relatives are pretty close cousins of a group of dinosaurs known as the raptors, which include animals like Velociraptor, who you might be familiar with from movies such as Jurassic Park, uh, carnivorous dinosaurs you can see, 
the blade-like teeth of a velociraptor, good for uh, cutting up meat. That's where the, the eyes would be over there. And so in Truodon and its relatives, see the teeth compared to Velociraptor are not quite as big. They're actually a bit tiny. And so some uh, paleontologists suggest that Truodon might have eaten both meat and plants, possibly. But we've learned a lot about Truodon um, by looking at different growth stages of it, all the way from being in the egg to examples like this here. This is the femur. Again, the same bone I showed you for the embryo still in its egg, but this is from a much larger example of Truodon. And so uh, Truodon is now an animal that uh, a lot has been learned about from Truodon eggs, Truodon embryos, little Truodon, big Truodon. And so we can increase how much we know about various dinosaurs by studying a large sample of fossils, not just one example, but, but many. And one of the dinosaurs that we have a huge sample for here at the Museum of the Rockies is the horned dinosaur, Triceratops. So here's Triceratops. Triceratops, which means a three-horned face, has its two big horns, one above each eye, a smaller horn above the nose, and it has this bony frill with spikes at the back of the skull. So I will show you a Triceratops fossil from here at the museum. Okay, can anyone tell me what part of a Triceratops am I holding up? Any guesses? You have guesses of a horn, the nose horn. Excellent. So yes, this is a horn of a Triceratops. And so Triceratops uh, is one of the, it's a pretty big, dinosaur generally has a gigantic head. Uh, some skulls of Triceratops are about the size of a small car. So, but in this case, this is from a relatively small Triceratops, a juvenile Triceratops. And so this here is where the eye would have been. And here's the horn above the eye. And you can see that in this example of a small Triceratops, the horn actually curves backwards above the eye. But when Triceratops got bigger, as we see here, there's a cast of the horn from a larger Triceratops, the eye would be down here, and the horn curves forward. So in Triceratops, the horns start out curving backwards and then become inclined forwards as they got older. At the same time as the horns we're changing shape. These spikes around the back of the frill also change shape. So this is an example of one of these spikes, what's called a frill epiossification. And see, there. Yeah, so you can see that it's very triangular, it's very spiky. Uh, and this is from a relatively young Triceratops, a little Triceratops. But if we look at the uh, epiossifications of a larger Triceratops, here's a section of frill from a, a bigger Triceratops. You see these, these one here, one there, those are the epiossifications on the frill of this Triceratops. And as opposed to being pointy and spiky, um, they have flattened onto the edge of the frill of this Triceratops. So as Triceratops grew up from a baby to an adult, the horns go from curving backwards to forwards, and the spikes around the frill, the epiossifications, uh, start off very triangular and spiky and eventually flatten onto the edge of the frill. And at the same time, there's evidence that the entire frill itself 
uh, was also changing shape. You might need some assistance with this part, Jimmy. So this here is the central bone, the parietal, uh, from the frill of a big horned dinosaur, a dinosaur that's been called Taurosaurus. And in Triceratops, this bone, the parietal, is often solid. There's no holes in it. But when Taurosaurus was discovered, it was seen that these huge holes, which I'm speaking to you through one of, uh, were in the frill, and so it was thought to be clearly a different species of dinosaur than Triceratops. But recently, studies of how Triceratops grew up from a baby to an adult uh, indicate that as Triceratops grew, uh, not only did its horns change shape and the spikes on the frill change shape, but the frill itself uh, expanded with growth and developed thin areas of bone in the same places where in this Taurosaurus frill, there are holes in the frill. So it could be that instead of being a different species of horned dinosaur that lived at the same time as Triceratops, that Taurosaurus with the holes in its parietal might just be what a really old Triceratops looked like. So in that case, uh, we're looking at how the growth of dinosaurs might affect our view of what kind of species are around or how many species were around. The idea that some dinosaur skulls might have changed so dramatically that at different growth stages it might be uh, confusing or ambiguous as to whether when you first find one, are, are you seeing a new species of dinosaur? Or is this just a growth stage of a dinosaur that we already know about? So an example of this, again, is this animal here. This is a, a model of the skull of a dinosaur that was named not that long ago. And it was named Dracorex Hogwartsia, which is an awesome dinosaur name. It translates to the Dragon King of Hogwarts, uh, the school from the Harry Potter books, because if you look at it, it kind of looks like what you might imagine the skull of a dragon would look like. It's very long and elongated. It's got all these spikes on it, these very cool spikes at the back of the skull. But more recent studies have shown that this animal was not full grown. It was quite a young, young animal. And as it grew, its head would have continued to change. So in this example of Draco Rex, you can see the head here is pretty flat. But as it grew, the shape would change to become something more like this model here. And so you see in, in this uh, model, the, the head has developed this prominent dome on top of the head. And so, and in some cases, don't get even bigger than is depicted here. So this is an example of uh, uh, an animal that was found. It was thought to be perhaps a new species of dinosaur, but it turns out that most likely it is a growth stage of an animal named Pachycephalosaurus. So this flat-headed dragon-like skull would have developed a big dome over its head, which would have expanded with growth. And again, this affects our view of what uh, the ancient ecosystems of the Mesozoic were like. Uh, were there one or two species of a certain kind of dinosaur running around, or was it just growth stages of a single species of dinosaur? And so by studying dinosaur growth and looking at the skulls, we can learn a lot about how these animals were changing shape as they grew and what this means for our interpretations of their world. So we can learn a lot by looking at the outsides of the fossils of dinosaurs, but we can also learn perhaps even more by looking inside 
the fossils of dinosaurs. Here at the Museum of the Rockies, we have a paleohistology lab, which is basically a, a laboratory where we cut out thin slices of bone from dinosaurs and other creatures, and then grind them down until they're so thin that light will pass through them, and we can study them under a microscope. So Jamie, if you could pull up the next slide, we'll take a quick look at some of the work that's been going on in the histology lab here at the Museum of the Rockies. I think our first image, you'll see uh, a sectioning of some Triceratops horn cores. So in one case there, you see that we have to use a saw to cut through a horn. And another, there's some chisels being used to remove a section of bone from this horn. And then uh, there's a saw being used to further section this sample of, of horn core from Triceratops. And then on the next slide, please. Here you're going to see our histology lab manager, Ellen Lamb, uh, working in the histology lab here to grind down these sections of bone so they're, until they're so thin that light will pass through them. And then we can study them under the microscope and see even more of the details inside of the bones than we would by just looking at the outside of the bones. So I have an example here of a fossil that has been through this process. Okay, so this is the humerus, or the upper arm bone, of a triceratops. And again, triceratops could be, get to be a pretty big animal. So this is from a pretty small uh, triceratops. It's the upper arm bone. Uh, but par uh, this humerus uh, of triceratops has gone to the paleohistology lab here and been sectioned so that we can look at its uh, structure under a microscope. And the piece that was removed from this bone has been replicated. An exact copy has been made and put back into this humerus. So that now, uh, if someone wants to measure or photograph the original bone, they can still do that. And we also have the data uh, from the piece that has been taken out of the bone. Uh, but I wonder if you can tell me, or you can identify, what part of this humerus, this triceratops bone, uh, is not part of the original bone? Could it be part of the top here of the humerus, a section of the middle, or perhaps the bottom of this humerus? Which segment of this uh, triceratops arm bone do you think might not be part of the original bone, but instead is an exact replica? Any guesses? Linda says the middle. Linda is correct. <laughs> <laughs> so, very good. Uh, so it is this section right here, uh, which has been removed, uh, uh, sliced up in the lab, been turned into slides, and then an exact replica was made and painted and put back so that it's difficult to even tell by looking at it that anything is missing from this bone. But if we flip it over, you can see here, there's a yellow tag uh, marking which part of the bone is not actually part of the bone. And that's so that, well, you know, if a paleontologist 100 or 200 years from now is going through the collections here and they want to study this fossil, it'll be very clear uh, that part of it is not part of the original fossil, instead is an exact replica. And that part of it was uh, used for histological studies. So let me give you a bit of a closer look at the process. Okay, so here is another horn from a triceratops. And this front part here is the actual, part of the actual horn, actual fossil. And this back part here with the yellow label, that is not actually fossil horn. That is an exact replica, a painted cast uh, from, uh, of this triceratops horn. So the way we make 
the replicas, we use a mold. So we'll take the, the piece of bone. And I think in this case here, we have a, a section of the original, the original fossil. So on, on the horn here, see it has this little bit that comes down here. And that's what we're seeing right there. So that's the actual piece from the bottom of this horn. And then the piece of fossil is, is covered um, with uh, latex and an exact, uh, it forms around it. The, the fossil is removed, leaving the hollow uh, space that where the fossil used to be. Then we put together a mold like that. And in here, we pour some resin. And when we open it, inside is an exact replica of the piece of fossil that had been uh, cut out. So, and we can leave that unpainted if we want, or have it a bright color. If we want it to be very apparent in looking at this, that that is not part of the actual horn. But in this case, it was uh, painted uh, to match exactly the rest of the horn. So again, the yellow tag tells us that it's a cast instead of part of the actual horn. The segment that's cut out is embedded in resin. This is part of that horn core embedded in resin. And then thin slices are taken out of the horn and they are mounted onto slides. So here's, here's part of the horn and it's been mounted onto this uh, slide. And if I hold this slide up to the light here, uh, you can see that the bone itself, the bone of the horn, uh, it's really dark. You can't see much through it at all because it's still relatively thick. So after this stage, uh, Alan Lamb in our histology lab often will spend many, many hours carefully grinding the bone down uh, until it is really, really thin. And there's an example of the finished product right here. So this is part of the horn of this same triceratops. And if I hold the finished slide up to the light, you can see that the light passes right through it. And so once we can do that, then we can study this section of a dinosaur horn under the microscope back in the lab. So if we pull up the next slide, please, Jamie, we'll take a look inside some of the horns of Triceratops to see some of the things that we can learn by looking there. So on your screen, you should see three images looking inside the horns of three different Triceratops. And uh, on the far left, that's a view inside the horn of a tiny juvenile Triceratops, one in which the horns were curving backwards, like I showed you earlier. And you can see that the bone is very spongy looking. There's lots of holes and openings in it. This is what really young, fast growing bone looks like. If we look at the image in the middle from a young adult Triceratops, now the horns are curving forward, you see these circular structures that you didn't see uh, in, the, in that first image on the left. These structures are called osteons, and they're areas where cells have come in and uh, eaten away pre-existing bone and then deposited new bone. And so basically, uh, this is how bone changes shape as it's growing. So the more of these circular uh, osteons you see, the more relatively mature that horn is. So you can tell just by looking at those two images that the one in the middle is more mature than the juvenile on the left. And if we look at the right, uh, the adult horn, we see osteons on top of osteons on top of osteons on top of osteons, uh, even more so than we see in the one in the middle. So just by sectioning these three Triceratops horns and looking inside under a microscope, we can tell that one of them is older than the other one, which is relatively older than the other one. But 
one of the things that we cannot tell from an image like that is the exact ages of any of these triceratops specimens. We can't look inside the horns as of yet and say, well, how old were any of these individuals? Was this one two? Was this one five? Was this one 23? Uh, to do that, ideally, we would want to look at different parts of the skeleton other than a horn, for say, uh, per se. And then, uh, at, for example, the ideal element to look at is the limb bones. So this here is a tibia, the shin bone, from a myasaura, the dinosaur that I spoke about a little bit earlier that uh, nested in colonies and took care of its young. And so this is, again, a bone that's been through the process of paleohistology here at the Museum of the Rockies. And it's a bit difficult to see, but this section here has been removed. It's a slightly different color. Uh, so this is where a uh, histological section was taken from this limb bone of this Mayasaura. And it's bigger than the model I showed you a little while ago, uh, but still a pretty small animal. Over here is a tibia from an even larger Mayasaura. And so uh, if I could borrow someone's finger for a second. You can see the little yellow tag that is denoting the section that was taken out of this Myasaur tibia. And so there are a lot of uh, Myasaur specimens here at the Museum of the Rockies, and many of them have been sectioned so we can look inside of them. And a lot of this work has been done by Dr. Holly Woodward Ballard, um, who teaches at Oklahoma State and received her PhD here uh, a few years ago. And uh, her and her colleagues have spent a lot of time examining the insides of the limb bones of Myasaur. If we pull up the next slide, please. Uh, Jamie will take a look inside uh, Maya tibia. And what you'll see is that it looks a little bit different than what we're seeing in the horns. Here is a view inside the limb of Myasaur, and marked by these arrows are what are called lines of arrested growth or lags. And these lines form annually each year. So if you have a section like this, you can count the number of lines and determine the age of the dinosaur when it died in a way similar to how you might count the number of tree rings uh, in a tree trunk to determine how old that tree was uh, at the time that it, that it was cut down. So we can, learn a bit about the absolute ages of, of an animal like Myasaur. And by doing this, uh, it's been discovered that Myasaur, again, this animal, it would have hatched out of an egg that would fit in the palm of your hand. So a little baby Myasaur would come out, and then it would have grown to be almost nine feet long in about a year. And that was discovered through the process of looking inside the bones of Myasaurus. Because, you know, otherwise you might look at an animal that's almost nine feet long and think, well, that has to be older than a year, maybe it's five or six or 10. Uh, but this was evidence that dinosaurs could grow very, very uh, rapidly. And so, that's just one avenue of exploration we can perform by looking inside the bones of dinosaurs uh, on top of looking at the outsides. So I believe the oldest example of Myasaura that's been uh, histoed so far uh, was about 14, 15 years old. So we can learn about the entire life history uh, of an animal like this by again having lots of examples of fossils from one kind of dinosaur to examine. And so this has been done with several species of dinosaurs. Another example is the animal that this belonged to. Okay, can anyone tell me what kind of dinosaur did this come from? I was guessing the T-Rex. Any 
other guesses? No. Okay, T-Rex is correct. This is the lower jaw, or part of the lower jaw, the dentary of a large Tyrannosaurus rex. You can see T-Rex has these really big teeth, uh, very robust teeth. Um, and so even an animal like T-Rex, we can look inside the bones and, and examine the histology to determine uh, how these animals grew. And so in the case of Tyrannosaurus rex, big meat-eating dinosaur, the oldest T-Rex that's been sectioned so far to explore how old it might be uh, is in the neighborhood of 28 uh, to 30 years of age or so. Uh, and so T-Rex also grew relatively uh, rapidly. And again, we know that by looking inside the bones of these animals. So dinosaurs were more than just you know, these big giants that we might think of sometimes. They each had their own life story spanning from little tiny babies that sometimes still in the eggs that we can find, uh, all the way up to big adults. And we can learn more about them and what they were like when they were alive, not only by studying the outsides of the fossils, but looking inside them uh, under the microscope. And that's what some of the work that's being done here at the Museum of the Rockies and other paleo labs around the world. And so uh, if anyone has any questions about dinosaur growth, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, earlier, it was asked how the jacket, how do you form the jacket? Oh, okay. So it's pretty simple to make a jacket like this. This is basically uh, the same process that's been used for over 100 years. We take uh, burlap and we cut strips of the burlap and then we soak them in plaster and water until they're soaked up. Uh, and then, so you'll have a, a fossil, say, say you found this and it's still in the rock. First, you would cover this in perhaps wet, wet paper towels to separate the bone from what you're about to put on top of it. And then you would coat it in layers of burlap and plaster uh, the burlap and plaster would harden over a little bit of time. You would dig around under it to put it on a pedestal. So it kind of looked like this white mushroom, uh, which you might have seen some examples of in the photos I showed earlier. Then you would break the pedestal, turn it over, and do the same thing on the other side. And often, uh, before we put on the other side of the jacket, we'll write a little note with the important information about what this was, where it was found, um, any, anything that might be helpful later for when it's opened uh, and providing information about the fossil. So that's, that's basically the process of making a field jacket. And then we have to bring it back to the lab. And in some cases, you know, the field jacket I showed you was pretty small, it could fit in my arms. Sometimes jackets can be gigantic and we might have to call in a helicopter to lift them up and put them on a flatbed trailer and then drive back to the museum. Depends on the size of what has been discovered. Um, two other questions about Triceratops. Mm -hmm. How big can they grow up to be? And did the holes have a purpose? Actually, there's three. And were they for self-defense? Okay, uh, so the first one was how big the Triceratops get? Uh -huh. uh, the Triceratops could be pretty, pretty big. Uh, I think some of the biggest specimens have an estimated body length in the neighborhood of 25 feet or so. The skulls could range to close to 10 feet in length, uh, in, in some, some cases, or about 9 feet in length. Uh, so there's Triceratops with skulls you know, the size of small automobiles. Uh, they probably were uh, pretty heavy animals, been estimated to be in the neighborhood of, you know, I think, 5 to 6 tons or perhaps even more for a big triceratops. Um, what was the second question? Uh, did the holes have any purpose? Oh, so uh, that's a good question. Uh, something that's still under uh, study by, by many people. But one possibility is that if you have, imagine you have this gigantic thing coming off the back of your head, and if it is solid, thick bone going back perhaps several feet, off the top of your head, it might make moving your head around a bit difficult. And so it could be that 
the loss of the bone helped with just being able to hold hold their head up right and you know still move their head around so as the frill expanded if it was thinning and developing these holes it would help keep things balanced and so uh, self-defense was the question next question you got it um can we hold this up again for a second sure okay so i actually want to show the other side of this so i'll go back you go forward i'll come around like this all right can can you see that at all all right if we tilt it like this okay now do you see these grooves on the surface of the frill here those are actually uh areas where blood vessels used to travel uh, over the surface of this frill. And if we, if we go this way, uh, Jamie, we look at it in cross section. In places, this frill is not very thick. OK, let's put this down really quick over here. That's good. So a frill like, like that, uh, it's covered in blood, basically, a lot of blood supplies going over it, and it's not super thick. So to me, it seems like that might be like if a part of your body was coming off of you and it was really thin and it had a lot of blood running through it, would you want to hold that up to something and say, bite this as a means of self-defense? Uh, you know, I don't know. It's, there's a lot of uh, study going on as to whether these might have functioned in self-defense in some form. Um, I tend to think that they probably serve more of a function for some kind of visual display. If you imagine having something like that, basically like a billboard on your head, perhaps it was very colorful, you have these spikes that were changing shape throughout life. Uh, and we know that modern relatives of dinosaurs, uh, like birds, are very, very visual. You might think of like a peacock's tail. So I, I lean towards the idea that they were probably functioning somewhat in display. So, but perhaps they were doing a bit of both. I know we're still studying the function uh, of these structures on, on Triceratops and other dinosaurs. Any other questions? That's it. I think that's all we have for today. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, John, for all your fantastic information. We will see you again in January. Please join us if you can. Happy holidays and happy new year as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.